All right, gentlemen, we're going to look at the 1970s. Um, usually we actually start this with a few songs um, that talk sort of about the uh, time period and the economics. Uh, I always play this one. I actually lived next to Allentown. Uh, I actually lived in this town, Bethlehem, um, when I was in graduate school. Allentown is just to the west of Bethlehem. I went there several times. Um, so there were some landmarks in this song that I could actually reference. Uh, but this is about the economic conditions of the 1970s. Um, this was a song about um, basically the leaving of Vietnam, which occurred during the same time period. Um, and I always like to go through this one. Most people don't realize that Born in the USA is not a patriotic song. Born in the USA is an anti-USA song. <laughs> It is a song that basically calls out America for treating her Vietnam veterans poorly. Um, so for everybody who likes to roll around fist pumping, you know, with their American flag flying, um, this, this is not a song you should do that to because that's not what it's about. But anyhow, the 1970s is going to be a decade dominated by an economic crisis. Um, you know, the end of World War II in 1945 saw the beginning of close to 30 years, but a, a solid 25 years of economic success for the United States, right? A quarter of a century of near unbroken economic growth. Now, why did this boom take place? Well, it took, it took plus place, excuse me, because... When World War II ended, if you think about it, America was the only game in town. A lot of the industrialized world had been blown up, right? A lot of the, the usual suspects weren't in the game anymore. Um, what had once been the economic power of Germany was now rubble, and it was a divided country. Um, France. Large parts of France had been destroyed, occupied, burned. Um, the western half of the Soviet Union was rubble. Not that they were much of an economic competitor to start with, necessarily. You know, England, um, Japan is wiped out. I mean, everybody is wiped out except the United States. We're the only industrial power that was basically undamaged by World War II. Um, outside of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invading a couple of unoccupied islands in the Aleutian Island chain, uh, and a couple of small forest fires that were caused by um, Japanese balloons that were launched by submarines um, and drifted over the U.S. and dropped like small fire bombs. America was unscathed in World War II. And when the war ends, the world has to rebuild, and they have to rebuild with American steel. And American farmers feed half the world. And, and so, you know, America, we benefited from a lack of competition. That was one thing that allowed us um, our success. Okay, that was one part of it. Um, another part of it was because of the lack of competition, resources were cheap, right? Oil was cheap, steel was cheap, or iron was cheap, um, everything was cheap, and a lot of it we had. Now, oil is the exception. Oil is the one resource that we don't really have enough of anymore. America had gone from being the world's leading oil producer. Um, to where we no longer could fulfill our needs and we had to import oil. You know, the great, the great oil fields of West Texas had begun to dry up, and so now America was importing oil, right? Um, that, is, that is going to become a problem, okay? I have a couple charts up here. This one shows the price of, of a barrel of oil from 1861 until 2006. Now, there are two lines, right? There is... Um, the blue, which is just the price as it was, you know, in the day, right? That is not accounting for inflation, okay? Um, the yellow line, I think, is a better line because it allows you to see what it would be in constant $2,008, right? So you can really, because, you know, saying that a barrel of oil was, I don't know, $3 in 1920, you know, well, how much was $3 in 1920, right? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So I think the yellow line is a little more telling because it allows you to look at, at what it is, um, you know, with, with inflation built in. And as you can see, for much of history, so to speak, 
especially America's industrial history, oil was a relatively steady cost. Right? I mean, if you actually look at it, a barrel of oil didn't really fluctuate even in their own time period. Accounting for inflation, it stayed pretty stagnant. Yeah, a few hiccups here and there, um, but really it stayed around $20, right? It hovered up and down around $20, actually a little less than $20, right? Until the 1970s, and then things get awful squirrely, right? Uh, you want to talk about squirrely? Uh, from you know my own life experience, from when I was a little kid in 1987, and, and again, the, the blue line is just in the in the day um, but the red line is accounting for inflation and you can see that they actually don't really differ that much um, especially once you get to the more near present but you can see a barrel of oil you know when i was seven years old a barrel of oil was you know 40 bucks um, and then as you can see you know in, in early 2008 it peaked at about 140 dollars a barrel um, so the, the price of oil has obviously, you know, in recent times gotten a little more volatile. But then we had, you know, significant drops too. So the price of oil is very important in this whole equation. It's not that there wasn't enough oil. That is one thing I want to clarify. It's not that the world was suddenly running out of oil. It had to deal with the pricing of oil and where America was getting her oil from. Back when we were drilling our own oil, problem solved. It's our oil, right? We're not at the mercy of a foreign government or a foreign company. You know, the United States government can make deals with American oil companies if that's what it takes. But by the 1960s, 1970s, OPEC had been created. OPEC is an acronym. It stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It was basically a cartel, a group of countries that, primor that primarily dealt in the exportation of oil. Um, these countries are not just in the Middle East, okay? Um, there are members of OPEC in South America, in Africa, you know, Venezuela is in OPEC, Nigeria is a member of OPEC. Don't think OPEC is just, Indonesia is in OPEC. So don't just think it's the Middle East. Um, there are obviously a number of Middle Eastern countries that are in OPEC. But OPEC is basically an organization that tries to set the price of oil for its members, right? So that they... If you're a member of OPEC, you're supposed to stick to OPEC price controls. And the idea is OPEC will set a price for a barrel of, of oil that will allow all OPEC members to prosper, right? It's price fixing. Well, by the 1960s, America was importing a lot of oil from OPEC. And that was okay when, when OPEC was going cheap. For years, OPEC sold oil cheaply, right? Prices were as low as they had been previously, right? OPEC did not really change anything. I mean, OPEC had been around for a while, and they really hadn't changed the price of oil. Um, but in 1973, actually, they, 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 they didn't even do it in 67, which is really amazing, because there was a war in 67 between Israel and her Arab neighbors. But the war ended so quickly, I don't think OPEC really had time to react. But in 1973, there was a war in the Middle East. It's called the Yom Kippur War. It was between Israel, Syria, and Egypt. Egypt and Syria tried to take down Israel in 1973. Um, after some initial success in their invasion attempt, they were both re re repelled. Um, the Israelis captured the Golan Heights from Syria, and they, um, they were able to retake the Sinai um, from an Egyptian invasion. But anyhow... Um, during the war, OPEC jacked up her prices on any country that basically supported Israel. Um, OPEC announced an embargo, actually, initially. They stopped selling oil to any country that supported Israel, primarily the United States and some of, of the Western European countries. When OPEC started selling oil again, they announced price increases. They increased the price of oil by 70%. And then they added another 130% price increase a couple of months later. So in the matter of about a year, the price of oil skyrocketed, right? Here you go. It's right here, right? 1973, 1973-74. This is where OPEC suddenly took oil prices and realized it was a weapon, that they could use the price of oil to force the United States and Western European countries 
to maybe stop supporting Israel, right? Or at least not be so openly supportive of Israel. Um, matter of fact, this created the first fuel shortages that America had experienced since the Second World War. You know, there were pictures in your book of, of lines, you know, they were limiting how much gas. People were lining up for gas. Gas stations ran out of gas. I mean, I know that we recently experienced stores running out of toilet paper and, you know, Lysol wipes. Uh, imagine gas stations running out of gas. That is what happened in 1973, 1974 because of the OPEC embargo. Um, the embargo ended a few months later. As I said, um, but the price, the prices stayed, you know, when, when once OPEC jacked up the prices, they were reluctant to lower them. Um, OPEC would raise prices several times in the 70s. And again, in 1980, by 1980, oil had jumped to $30 a barrel. It had been $3 a barrel at the start of 1973. At the start of 73, we were paying $3 a barrel for oil. By 1980, that had jumped up to $30 a barrel. As you can see, we went from in 2008 dollars, I don't know, $18 a barrel, let's call it, let's call it $18 a barrel. By 1980, we are paying close to $100 a barrel, right? So the price had gone up by a factor of, of roughly five, five times as expensive. Now, not only does that mean that, that the price of a gallon of gas has gone up, let's say, by a factor of five, right? You know, you used to pay 13 cents a gallon for gas, and now you find yourself, you know, spending 65 cents a gallon for gas. That affects the price of everything, because everything has oil in it. Everything. The food you eat, the pesticides and chemicals that are used in agriculture have oil in them. The machinery that tills the fields and harvests the crops needs oil to operate. The trucks that deliver those crops to the warehouse, to the market, whatever, run on oil, right? Or gasoline, which is an oil derivative. You know, every factory in America uses oil to some degree at some point, you know? And so you can't escape oil increases. You know, you can't just buy an electric car and say it's all good. By the way, electric cars didn't exist back then. But there was no way to avoid the fact that this oil price increase was going to dramatically affect prices across the board. Everything in society was going to become more expensive now, right? And so all of a sudden, Americans saw the price of everything go up, okay? Now, that is one piece of the problem, right? That is one aspect. Oil prices are not the only problem, though. But oil prices, I will show you. Helped cause inflation. <laughs> Here's the U.S. historical inflation rate. As you can see, inflation, uh, this is the 1970s right here. Um, if you're curious, in the 1960s, for example, in 1965, the inflation rate was about 1.9%, close to 2%, right, for the year. Um, 1960, 1.4%. Uh, 1955, 0.4% actually, right? It was, a, it was a down year. I think that's 1955 right there, maybe. Um, and so, you know, inflation rates ha had been relatively, you know, we had hiccups here and there, um, but nothing dramatic. And all of a sudden in the 70s, you can see we get 5% inflation. We get double-digit inflation at some points, right? And that is in part the result of that oil, that oil price increase. It made the price of everything go up. Everything got more expensive, right? In a matter of months. But another problem for America's economy was our economy began to slow down, right? America's economy began to struggle in the early 70s. And why? There's a couple of factors that we have to take into account, okay? One, competition. Okay, all those German factories that we blew up in World War II, they got rebuilt, and now Germany's back in the game. Same thing with Japan, and here's the thing. They built the newest, the latest, the greatest, right? They built a brand new factory. They didn't build the old factory that we blew up that was a 20-year-old factory. When they built a new factory in 1955, they built a brand new factory with the latest technology. American factories, some of them are 30, 40 years old, and they're using the same technology they've been using for 30 or 40 years. You know, 
I went to graduate school in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I could see Bethlehem Steel out of some of my classroom windows. The blast furnaces at Bethlehem Steel were built at the turn of the century. Those were the blast furnaces that were producing steel at Bethlehem Steel in the 1950s. It was the same tech, it was 50 year old technology. Now, some of you are wondering, is there a different way to make steel? Yeah, there's electric induction, there's basic oxygen furnaces, there's all sorts of new technology that had emerged in the 50s and 60s. Bethlehem Steel didn't do any of that. Well, they eventually did install a BOF, a basic oxygen furnace, but by then it was too late. Those European steel companies, you know, they had built these new technologies, and it allowed them to make stuff faster and cheaper than American companies. American companies could have spent their money on those new technologies, but instead they gave themselves bonuses. They gave the union workers pay raises, right? I like to pick on Bethlehem Steel. I know a lot about it because I did a lot of research on it when I was living there. There was an article in the 1950s in like Forbes magazine. Seven of the 10 highest paid executives in America worked for Bethlehem Steel. Instead of spending their company's profits on new technology to keep their company competitive in the future, they built themselves a PGA caliber golf course in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The only people who live there are people who work at Bethlehem Steel, right? And they paid their executives incredible salaries, right? Meanwhile, German factories, they built the newest technology, so by the 1960s, they could do it faster and cheaper. So America is now facing foreign competition, and this competition can do it faster and cheaper. Oh, and don't forget, because there's competition, there's competition for resources. All those cheap resources America was used to getting, America now has to compete with foreign companies just to get the resources, not just to produce the finished product. You got to fight to get the resources to make the products, right? And then you got to factor in that, you know, America didn't really have a way to transition some of this workforce, right? This is something that we're actually sort of, of talking about having to deal with in the next couple of decades again, that all sorts of jobs are going to disappear and we're not going to have anything for these people to do um, is the current argument, right? Well, that was kind of the truth, too, in America. You know, technology is a wonderful thing. And I know, you know, everybody talks about the future is in STEM jobs. And I don't know if that's true or not. But I know that a guy who's worked in a steel mill for 20 years is not going to do well in a, in a computer job because he doesn't know anything about computers because that's not what he does, right? And that's not what his education was. You know, you got to remember, this is the 1970s, guys. People went to high school. And then they got a job, right? Not that many people went to college. And people working in factories definitely didn't go to college. And so when American manufacturing jobs began to disappear, there was no alternative for these people. You know, they couldn't go get a job in IT. You know, they had no training. They had no preparation. All sorts of new jobs were being created. I mean, new service industry and information jobs, but these industrial workers weren't properly equipped to do that education-wise. Matter of fact, that song that I mentioned, you know, Allentown, um, it even talks about, you know, the, the high school graduations and how they never really helped us. I mean, that, that's a reference to it. Um, and so America suddenly found herself falling behind economically, and unemployment was rising, right? And all of a sudden, we had a brand new phenomena, and this brand new phenomena got a really cool name. It's called stagflation, okay? It's a portmanteau, as we would call it, which is where you basically make up a word by slamming two words together, okay? It's not a compound word because it's not a real word. Stagflation. Stagflation. We have a stagnant economy, but we are experiencing inflation. And that's never happened before. <laughs> if we were in school, I'd be freaking out right now because it's one of those topics that gets me all excited because it is it is a unique moment in American history. Never before in American history had we ever experienced an economy that was in danger of going into a recession but was experiencing price increases. You know, every economist – thought the only way prices go up is if there is a growing economy. You know, the only way inflation occurs is because of overconsumption, right? Because, you know, people are, are fighting for things 
and sellers know that and sellers are able to jack up their prices or there is a shortage of goods because there is overconsumption because there's too much wealth. You know, the theory that you could have inflation like this when the American economy was going like this is unheard of, right? Unprecedented. And the real problem with stagflation is because it's never happened before, ever, no one knows what to do. No one knows how to solve it because since it is a combination of two economic events, the solution to one is the cause of the other, right? We've already learned in our class about Keen, uh, Keynesian economic theory, right? John and our Keynes and, and, and the idea that if, if the economy is in trouble, government spending, right? New deal. Just throw some government money out there, create some job programs. It'll all be good, right? I want to get back to my pointer. Sorry. Well, guess what? Government spending is what causes inflation. When the government just starts throwing money around, it causes inflation. I forgot to mention that. Lyndon Johnson helped get this ball rolling. The Great Society. Remember all those programs where Lyndon Johnson started, like, I don't know, offering you medical care and offering you child care and offering you free of charge preschool and offering cities all kinds of money and offering this and offering that and free college tuition and everything else under the sun? When the government starts throwing money around, people start throwing their money around and buying all sorts of stuff. And so actually consumer price, con consumers spending helps start the inflation trend that peaked in the 1970s. But anyhow, government spending causes inflation or contributes to it, right? Now, how do you stop inflation? Well, you reel in the money supply. How do you reel in the money supply? You can raise taxes. People have less money, they have to spend less, it drives prices down. You can increase the interest rate. Increasing the interest rate means it's more expensive to borrow money, which means people are less likely to borrow money because they don't want to incur the expense, so they'll spend a little bit less, and that'll kind of start to trickle down, right? But that could cause a recession because if it's you know harder to borrow money or you're paying more in taxes, then you're going to spend less. And we already have a problem with America is starting to face higher unemployment. People are struggling to keep their jobs or find jobs. American companies are having trouble selling their products because of foreign competition, because the other guy's doing it faster and cheaper. We don't know how to solve this. If we try and tackle inflation, we'll cause a recession. If we try and prevent a recession by sending people checks, we're just going to increase inflation. Richard Nixon inherited this problem and richard nixon decided he would try and tackle inflation first he figured that that was the that was the the evil that should be dealt with first because richard nixon thought if i focus on trying to stop a recession i'm just going to cause inflation which will wipe out anything that i do right i mean i can fix the economy sort of but if i end up causing double digit inflation it's going to wipe out whatever good i did and so Nixon tried to tackle inflation. How? He proposed tax raises, which was politically unpopular, and the American people and the American Congress made it very clear that they weren't going to go along with that. So then he told the Federal Reserve to raise the interest rate, right? Raise the Fed rate and make it har harder to borrow money. Well, they did that, and it didn't stop the inflation rate. And then he actually used his power as the president to institute price and wage freezes. He announced that there'd be a 90-day freeze in prices and wages in this country, and then he built in a system to like limit future price and wage increases. I would just like to point out that this is a Republican president, right, announcing that the United States government is going to determine prices and wages in a time of peace, not war. Um, talk about, you know, violating the principles of your party. But anyhow, he announced price freezes and wage freezes, and guess what? That didn't stop it. By 1974, um, the unemployment rate had risen to above 5%, and the inflation rate was 12.3%, according to my statistics that I was able to dig up. Um, your book says 5% unemployment. Um, they said by, by the time um, he resigned, I actually have that the 1974 unemployment rate was 7.2, so maybe that is by the end of the year. 
Um, oh, that is, that is as of December. So by the end of the year, unemployment had jumped up to 7%. Um, remember, he resigned in what, August? August, September, August. Um, so by the end of the year, it climbed to 7%. Um, if you're wondering, as I said, unemployment in 1970, 6%. 71, 6%. 72, 5.2%. Um, and at the, at the end of 73, it was 4.9 or right at 5. Um, so we'd, we'd been hovering around the 6, the 5, but it's going to start to jump up to the 7s and the 8s. Um, by 1975, it will be 8.2 by the end of the year. And here you go, inflation rate. I will go starting in 1966. 3.5, 3, 4.7, 6.2, 5.6. Now in 1971, it was 3.3. And in 1972, it was 3.4. But then in 1973, again, the same year that the oil prices got jacked up, 8.7. 1974, 12.3, right? So Richard Nixon, of course, waved goodbye and got on the helicopter and left to avoid being impeached. Um, he is replaced by his vice president, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford is a really nice guy. Um, de decent, honest, hardworking, you know, politician, actually a Navy vet from World War II, um, famously played football at Michigan. He went to Yale Law School, um, served in the House of Representatives after World War II. Um, he actually was chosen to be the uh, Senate, min or excuse me, the House Minority Leader in 1965. A lot of congressional experience. Everybody liked him. It's partially why he got tapped to be the vice president. And Ford almost immediately shot himself in the foot. His first month in office, he announced on September 8th, 1974, that he was getting Richard Nixon a pardon. He announced a full pardon for Richard Nixon for all crimes he may have committed or taken part of as part of the Watergate scandal. Now, I know a few of you are going to say, you said he resigned to avoid impeachment. Impeachment is a proceeding that the United States Senate takes against an elected official. And then the Senate can remove you from office if they want. The Senate can't send you to jail. Richard Nixon was in trouble for actual crimes, right? I mean, he actually did illegal stuff. Like, he obstructed justice, right? I mean, he lied. Um, not under oath, though, so he wouldn't be busted for perjury. But he obstructed justice. He obstructed a federal investigation. Like, he did a lot of, of stuff. Um, he was part of a conspiracy. He could be charged with a number of crimes and go to prison. And Gerald Ford said, yeah, no, we're, we're not going to charge him. He's, he gets a pardon. He gets a pass. Now, it wasn't a favor necessary. I mean, Gerald Ford's already president, so it does him no good to pardon Nixon. Why did he do it? He said he did it because he felt like this great American tragedy needed to end. You know, as he said it, look, we could go through, and it would take years, right? This is one of those things that would take a couple of years to go through the justice system, right? And, and Gerald Ford said, for what? Richard Nixon has already been humiliated in front of God and everybody. The man had to resign the presidency. He's done, right? He's done. You're never going to hear from Richard Nixon ever again, right? And he's like, the guy already flew off into the sunset. Do we need to send him to jail? Do you want to spend millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars prosecuting Richard Nixon? So what? So he can get a couple months in, in jail? No, let's just, it's done, right? Um, Ford insisted he wasn't doing it out of sympathy. He was doing it for the better interest of the American public. He said, we need to avoid a, a, a trial that will divide the nation. Unfortunately for Ford, this, this killed his approval rating. It, overnight, literally overnight. His approval ratings dropped 21% from 71 to 50. And it really cost him support the rest of his presidency, right? I mean, out the gate, he lost 20% of his support. And he's still got to deal with this stagflation issue. But don't worry, Jerry Ford has the answer. He had a press conference and he's like, I got the answer. We are going to have a new campaign. I want to point out, by 1975, we are in our worst recession since the Great Depression. Unemployment is near 9%. Um, inflation is going to hit the double-digit mark, right? I mean, things are bad, right? Here you go, by 1975. Yeah, yeah, we were up to um, almost 9%. By the end of the year, we're going to be 82 
1974, we had 12 percent, you know, inflation. Um, and so Gerald Ford is going to announce, basically, he wants Americans to practice voluntary controls. He doesn't believe the government should control wages and prices, but he wants voluntary controls. And he like he put he pulls out this button and he puts it on his jacket lapel, and he's like, "We're gonna win against inflation. We're gonna whip inflation now." I am not kidding. Gerald Ford's big announcement on how we were gonna save the economy was we were supposed to all wear buttons that were gonna remind us that we all had a duty to whip inflation now by spending less. That was his answer. Um, needless to say. It didn't do anything, right? It was a failure. Um, sorry, Jerry. Now, on the foreign policy side of things, Gerald Ford is going to try and keep the detente um, cooperation going. He actually kept Henry Kissinger in the White House as his Secretary of State, actually. Um, and he began to, con well, excuse me, he did not begin. He continued to pursue detente with the Russians and the Chinese. Matter of fact, in August of 1975, he met with the leaders of NATO and the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union to sign the Helsinki Accords. The Helsinki Accords were a series of agreements that, first of all, NATO recognized the borders of Eastern Europe. Right? Like we acknowledge that the Soviets had basically created these satellite states and they had dominated them for 30 years, and, and the borders were what they were, and East Germany was East Germany, and and all that stuff, right? In return, the Soviets promised to uphold basic human rights um, for both their citizens and the citizens of the Warsaw Pact satellite nations. And this included the right to travel across national borders. So basically, we told the Russians, you can control Eastern Europe, but we would like you to be a little nicer to your people. And they said, sure, we'll do that. Um, eventually, spoiler alert, they're not going to do that, and that's going to be the beginning of the end of detente. They're going to sign the paper, and then they're totally not going to follow through on it, but we'll get back to that. As we have already learned, uh, in April of 1975, North Vietnam is going to steamroll South Vietnam. Jerry Ford is going to ask Congress to start bombing and, and save South Vietnam, and they say no, so Vietnam will fall. No one blames Gerald Ford for that one. It just it happened during his presidency. One thing that did happen during his presidency, though, that's on him, it's called the Mayaguyas incident. In May of 1975, um, the Mayaguyas, which was an American cargo ship traveling off the southern coast of Cambodia, uh, was captured by the Cambodian government, who claimed that it was a spy ship, and it wasn't, um, and were holding the crew hostage really quickly. By this point, Cambodia had fallen to a, a communist regime known as the Khmer Rouge, and they were nuts. Uh, if you want to read up about some people who did some horrible things to their own people, read about what the Khmer Rouge did. Um, they wiped out, it's estimated, about a quarter of Cambodia's population um, through what they did, which included a mass starvation that they created. But anyhow, they took this ship and they basically just kidnapped the crew and claimed that they were spies and they were threatening to execute them. And so Gerald Ford ordered a rescue mission. Uh, it failed miserably. A helicopter crashed. And then um, if anybody has seen the movie Black Hawk Down, it kind of turned into that. It turned into the mission turned into not a mission to rescue the Mayaguyas, but a mission to rescue the rescue mission, which had crashed. Um, it was awful. A bunch of Americans were killed. Um, three guys got left behind and supposedly were captured by the Cambodians and brutally tortured and then murdered. The last names on the Vietnam Wall are the men that were killed in the Mayaguyas incident because it happened right after the fall of, of South Vietnam and, and it had to do with, you know, communist in Cambodia. These men are considered the last victims of the war in Southeast Asia. So their names are on the Vietnam War Memorial. But that was a that was a negative, you know, embarrassing moment for Gerald Ford um, on the on the foreign policy front. Gerald Ford was only president for 
a little over two years before he's got an election. Poor guy did not get a long, a long time in office before he had to go up against Jimmy Carter. That's right. As 1976 approached, unemployment is on the rise. Inflation is on the rise. People are finding it harder to pay their bills. They're finding it harder to keep their job. Um, the Soviets look to be improving. Um, it looks like American power is, is down. I mean, we, we, we left Vietnam. I'm not going to say we ran away, but let's be real. We didn't exactly leave on our own terms. And then our ally, South Vietnam, fell rapidly. And then the whole incident in Cambodia and all this sort of stuff. Americans just weren't sure that America was on the right course. The challenger for Gerald Ford was Jimmy Carter, James Earl Carter Jr., known as Jimmy Carter, former governor of Georgia, no national political experience whatsoever. Um, but Jimmy Carter, actually, that was going to be his great strength. He's like, I'm not part of that Washington crowd, right? I'm, I wasn't part of Watergate or any of that, right? I was in Georgia working the family farm. His family had a big peanut farm, uh, like a big, like, industrial size. Don't think that this was just a guy on a front porch in overalls. He had a very successful family business. Um, but yeah, he kind of did the whole, I'm not part of that corrupt Washington, D.C. crowd. I'm just an honest man from Georgia, and I'm going to bring honesty to government. Um, Jimmy Carter was known for also his, his very strong faith, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a few moments. Carter said that he would create new programs for energy development, tax reform, welfare reform, national medical care. Now, um, as I said, more than the programs, it was his image that was supposed to also help him. Um, you know, that he was honest. You didn't have to worry about any of the shenanigans you had with Richard Nixon. Ford, although, like to point out that Jimmy Carter is proposing a lot of programs that will simply create higher rates of inflation. They will require tax increases. So you're going to have more inflation and you're going to pay more in taxes which means it's going to be even harder to pay your bills, and he's not going to solve anything. He's just going to make it even worse. Well, in the end, Jimmy Carter won. And Jimmy Carter was able to win 50.1% of the popular vote. Ford won 47.9% of the popular vote. Jimmy Carter captured 297 electoral votes to Gerald Ford's 240. And as you can see, Jimmy Carter showed that a Southerner could win the South for the Democratic Party. Um, you know, an area that had gone solidly Richard Nixon um, definitely voted for one of their own in 1976. Uh, as you can see, Jimmy Carter really, he got the South, and then he got kind of the decimated industrial land of America, um, and then Gerald Ford got everything else. Um, so, Jimmy Carter, gentlemen, is, oh, then county by county, God knows we couldn't couldn't go without one of those. Oh, yeah, and there's the famous Jimmy Carter. He is the male version of Eleanor Roosevelt, in the face at least. Now, Jimmy Carter tried to end the recession of an unemployment. I mean, he's going to focus on the economy, right? I mean, that is the biggest issue facing him. Um, but Jimmy Carter tried to end the recession and end unemployment by proposing a bunch of government programs, government spending tax cuts, right? He's like, I'll take care of all this. I'll get people, excuse me, back to work, you know, able to pay their bills, etc. Jimmy Carter caused a surge in inflation with this. Uh, here you go. In 1976, inflation was down to 4.9% that year. Unemployment sat at 7.8%, but inflation was down to 4.9%. And remember, it had been 123 at the end of 1974. In 1977, Jimmy Carter was president most of that year. Unemployment was down to 6.4, but inflation was up to 6.7. He basically created a 2% increase in, in the inflation rate. Um, and inflation jumped dramatically in 1978. The unemployment rate basically didn't change. It was 6%, but the inflation rate jumped another 2.3% to 9%. Basically, Jimmy Carter doubled the inflation rate in his first two years as president. And so when the inflation hit, Jimmy Carter backtracked. And he said, okay, I'm going to raise the inflation rate. I'm going to stop some of the tax cuts. 
I'm actually going to veto some of the very government programs I propose so we can limit government money that's getting out there. we got to get inflation under control. Um, so he kind of started a program and then shot his own program down when he realized it wasn't working. And here you go. If you're curious. Sorry. There you go. There you go. That's Jimmy Carter. <laughs> right there. That's the inflation surge under Jack. That's Jimmy Carter right there. Okay. Now. Jimmy Carter's main focus was energy. Um, Jimmy Carter was convinced that really at the end of the day, um, energy was oil, right? The cost of oil, the cost of, of you know, paying for power, paying for le electricity. Um, just the price of oil. You know, you can do a lot of stuff, but if you can't get the price of oil down, you can't do anything, right? Because you, you can't lower prices if you don't lower the price of oil or find a way to spend less on energy. Heat your home less, you know, burn less oil, drive less, burn less oil. Like we got to find a way to, to create a surplus of oil to where we can drop prices somehow. I do want to point out too very quickly, um, Jimmy Carter had a, a passion and love for energy that went well beyond the presidency. Most people don't know this. Jimmy Carter has a degree in nuclear engineering. Uh, when he was in the United States Navy, Jimmy Carter worked with nuclear reactors. He actually worked alongside Hyman Richtover, the man who made America's Navy the nuclear power that it is today. You know, it was Hyman Richtover who made all American submarines nuclear power and all of our aircraft carriers nuclear power. We're the only country on Earth that can say that. Um, but anyhow, that's what Jimmy Carter did. He worked with nuclear reactors, so he actually knows nuclear engineering. Um, so his, his passion and, and love for the whole energy question goes well beyond his presidency. But that was his big focus. You know, we've got to find a way to wage a war against this energy consumption that's holding us back, as he termed it. Jimmy Carter actually created the Department of Energy, a cabinet-level position. And he kept encouraging people to find ways to reduce energy consumption. You know, turn the heat down, wear a sweater, drive less, buy a more fuel-efficient car. Why are you buying that gigantic, you know, Oldsmobile or Buick when you can buy a more gas-efficient Honda or Volkswagen or whatever, right? Now, at the same time that Jimmy Carter was encouraging you and I to find ways to use less oil, Jimmy Carter was also being pressured by the energy companies themselves, who said, look, Richard Nixon put price controls in place. That means we really can't make money off oil. Right, like we can, we, we barely make any money off the oil we are currently selling because of all the price controls that Richard Nixon put in place years ago. You need to get rid of those price controls, okay? There's really no way for us to compete with OPEC and beat them at their own game. You know, we have to sell oil almost as as much as OPEC does, right? You know, there, there's no real wiggle room for us because of all these regulations. They said, get rid of the regulations. Um, it's hard for us to make a profit. And by the way, because we can't really make a profit, there's really no incentive for us to explore. There's no real incentive for us to try and find new oil reserves, because even if we do, we can't afford to build more oil drilling rigs or offshore rigs or whatever. You know, we, we can't do this if there's no money in it, right? So they pushed Jimmy Carter to basically cut back the regulations and let the American energy companies go. Well, Jimmy Carter said, all right, I'm going to get rid of a lot of the rules and regulations, but I'm going to keep the windfall profits tax. What does that mean? That means that basically Jimmy Carter said this. I need to draw. All right. He said, okay, here's how much money you make, right? All right. Now I'm just going to, sorry, this isn't perfect. All right, let's say that you're going to pay, as a company, you're going to pay 10% tax up to, you know, if you get here, it's 10%. If you get here, we're going to start making you pay 15% tax. But if you get above this amount of profit, and again, this is profit, we're going to hit you with, I don't know, 35%, right? If you cross this line, we are going to hit you everything above this line, right? Everything above here will be hit with a 35% tax, again. Here to here, 10% tax. Here to here, 15 But up here, 35%. Because I don't want you people price couching. I don't want you guys just, you know, running away with all this money that you, that you took from the American consumer. Well, the problem with that is where do you think the oil companies went? 
to here. And then they stopped. Like oil companies literally calculated how much they should drill, how much they should sell, and they wanted to stay below this line because there's no point in making money if you suddenly have to give 35 or 40 percent of it to the government. It's oil, guys. It's not mayonnaise. It's not going to go bad. You can let that oil that you drilled sit in barrels and sell it next year, right? So honestly, if an oil company got to the verge of their windfall profits tax in early December, there was no incentive for them to pump any more oil because they would simply lose money, right? And so Jimmy Carter basically, he got rid of all the rules and regulations, but he didn't get rid of the tax laws that were one of the most important aspects of it all, and that didn't help. Jimmy Carter, in late in the summer of 1979, there was another major fuel shortage because of a crisis in the Middle East we'll talk about in a moment. And so Jimmy Carter um, gave several public television addresses, and one speech was very famous. It's known as the Malaise speech. Jimmy Carter talked about a crisis of confidence. And, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff that basically made it sound like it's your fault, America. Like, you people won't listen. I tell you to, to, to use less oil, and you buy inefficient cars, right? Instead of buying fuel-efficient cars, you buy a big Cadillac that gets like a half a mile to the gallon, right? I tell you to turn the heat down and wear a sweater, you turn the heat up. You know, I tell you to do this. He basically pinned it on the American people. Now, I'm not saying he's wrong. But it's not good politics, right? And it really hurt him in the eyes of the American people. Speaking of leadership, Jimmy Carter is a nice guy. He really is. Very religious man, honest man, terrible president. From the sense of he was overly focused on details. There's actually a Saturday Night Live skit I usually show. Um, that, that brings this up, and it makes fun of how Jimmy Carter was an expert in everything, right? So technical-oriented, right? Nuclear engineer. Um, and that was one of the problems with Jimmy Carter. He got so caught up in the details, so caught up in the facts and the figures. There was no, there was no unifying theme. He wanted to solve every problem, right? If you came in with a problem, he would want to sit down and work on it. And as president, you got to pick and choose. You can't win every battle. You can't solve every problem. There come points where you just have to go, I can't do that, sorry, right? I've only got oh so much time and oh so much money, right? But Jimmy never did that. He tried to do everything, and that meant he didn't do anything real well, right? Because he, he couldn't focus on two or three things. Um, his leadership style, it's, it's in political science, he's known for having his administration in what's called the circular method. Basically, he wanted everybody to report to him. You know, he didn't delegate anything. He's like, oh, you got a report? Bring it to me. Let's go over it. And it's like, dude, let somebody else review the report, and then they can basically determine if you need to read it or not, right? And they'll give you a summary. Nope, Jimmy Carter wanted to read it. So he was bogged down. There was no overarching theme or drive or focus. And so it was not a very effective leadership style. And that's what I mean when I say he was just a bad president. I'm not saying he's a bad guy, but his leadership style was very ineffective because he tried to solve every problem at once, and you can't do that. Now, that means that by 1979, polls showed that his popularity with the American people had actually fallen below that of Richard Nixon's during the Watergate scandal. You know you have done things wrong when somehow Richard Nixon, in the midst of the political scandal, which would cost him his job, was more popular than you. Although Richard Nixon eventually did go further down than Jimmy Carter, but what your book should have said, it was at the uh, at the beginning of um, the Watergate investigations. Regardless, this guy is, is not making many friends. Um, Jimmy Carter's foreign policy was also mixed in a way. Jimmy Carter, again, is a very moral man, a very moral man, a very religious man. And he believed that the United States needed to Basically, stick to her stick to her her beliefs, um, as he termed it, right and honest, truthful and decent. And so he believed that the United States had to conduct itself that way in foreign affairs. So, for example, he knew that for many, many, many years, as, as we have learned, uh, the United States and Latin America have not gotten along 
Latin America looks at the United States as the big bully to the north. And a lot of our history has kind of supported that view. Jimmy Carter knew that the greatest resource in Central America was the Panama Canal. Every year, hundreds of ships went through the Panama Canal, raking in millions upon millions upon millions of dollars in um, toll fees that went straight to the United States of America. America controlled the Panama Canal. You remember, we got the right to build it when we helped overthrow the government of Colombia um, in Panama. You know, I know that we built it, but we had made our money back many times over, right? And Jimmy Carter decided we needed to let the people of Panama have their canal and make the money and build their country. And so Jimmy Carter signed a treaty to return the pay in 1978. He, and he got the Senate to ratify it, by the way. Um, it wasn't just Jimmy Carter, but he convinced the United States Senate in 1978 to sign a treaty which would return the Panama Canal to the Panamanians on December 31st, 1999. And we did. Um, Jimmy Carter did not hesitate to call out the Soviets for violating the Helsinki Accords. Um, you know, Gerald Ford kind of noticed they weren't living up to their end of the bargain. But remember, Gerald Ford was trying to keep detente going. Um, and he was giving them a chance to maybe clean up their act. Jimmy Carter was not playing that game. Jimmy Carter called out the Soviet Union for being a violator of human rights for, you know, imprisoning, imprisoning protesters, for example. Um, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979 to prop up a, a failing um, communist government there or allied government there, Jimmy Carter announced an embargo on American grain sales to the Soviet Union, which was a huge deal. A lot of people don't know that. We helped keep the Soviets from starving during the Cold War by selling them bread. Um, he not only announced America would stop selling bread or grain to the Soviet Union, he announced that we would not be going to the Summer Olympics in Moscow. We boycotted, which was a big deal. Um, it was a big protest. And detente basically collapsed under Jimmy Carter. Um, he basically showed the Soviets we weren't going to cooperate, we weren't going to play along. Um, he was not going to have any of that. Of course, a slight problem with that. Jimmy Carter was kind of poking the Soviets at the same time that Jimmy Carter was cutting defense spending, and that's going to come back to cost him in the 1980 election. Spoiler, sorry. Um, in the Middle East, Jimmy Carter had success and failure. You win some, you lose some, right? For example, in 1978, he helped negotiate a peace treaty that we call the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Israel and Egypt had been fighting each other since literally the birth of Israel. Israel was created in 1948. And ever since then, Egypt had been a brutal enemy of Israel and had fought Israel in 1948. Um, they had another fight in 1956, the Suez Crisis, you might remember from our, our coverage of the Cold War. Um, Egypt had basically created a coalition of Arab nations to attack Israel in 1967. They had another war. Uh, and then Egypt invaded Israel in 1973. So in like 25 years, Egypt and Israel had gone to war majorly four times. And there had been countless skirmishes and fighter plane incidents, etc. Egypt was, was one of the leading countries that had been pushing to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. But in 1978, 1979, um, Egypt announced this peace deal with, with Israel, basically announcing that they were no longer going to try and take out Israel. And that is really important because if Egypt is not going to be on your team, you're not going to win. I mean, think of it this way. If you're the Arab countries and you can't take down Egypt, excuse me, you can't take down Israel with Egypt, how are you going to do it if Egypt's not on your team, right? I mean, you can't win the game with them on your team, and now they quit your team. You're not going to win. That's why there hasn't been a major war between the Arabs and the Israelis since 1973, right? There have been a few little skirmishes between, you know, terrorist groups and Syria um, has attacked Israel a little. But there has not been a major war between Israel and her neighbors since the Camp David Accords. 
because everyone knows that if Egypt won't help you fight Israel, there's no point in fighting Israel. So that was a big step towards Middle Eastern peace, um, brought to you by Jimmy Carter. Now, unfortunately for Jimmy Carter, not long after the Camp David Accords were signed, um, bad news in Iran. Iran had been our ally. Again, you remember the Cold War, I hope. We supported the Shah um, when the Russians tried to bully Iran. We kind of stepped up and backed up Iran. Iran, actually. Um, and the Shah was our buddy. The king of Iran was our buddy. And we supported him. We provided him with weapons and equipment and support. But the Shah was not popular with his people. He was repressive. But he wasn't communist, right? So we're cool with that. And he also wanted to westernize his country. He wanted to reform Iran along Western lines. And hardline Islamic clerics, priests, opposed that, right? They didn't, they didn't want to see you know, the extension of women's rights and, and some of the Western culture that was going on. And in January of 1979, um, protests against the government of the Shah were so strong, the Shah was forced to flee, and his monarchy was toppled, and he was replaced by an Islamic republic right, led by the religious leader Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, Khomeini had a great hatred of the United States because for all that time we had supported the Shah. In November of 1979, a bunch of revolutionary students basically stormed the American embassy in Tehran, the capital, and they took 52 Americans hostage and they threatened to kill them. And we spent months negotiating, trying to get the hostages released, right? We offered them all sorts of deals. Finally, in April 1980, Jimmy Carter approved a rescue plan called Operation Eagle Claw. It failed miserably. Um, I'll give you the very quick summary. Helicopters were going to fly off an aircraft carrier. Um, the problem is Tehran is like in the middle of Iran, which is a big country. So the helicopters were going to have to refuel somewhere. The plan was for the helicopters to fly very low so they wouldn't be picked up on radar. A few American C-130s would also fly crazy low. They would all land in the desert in the middle of Iran. They were going to refuel the helicopters. The helicopters were going to go rescue the hostages, and then everybody was going to hightail it out of Iranian airspace. Right, the American C-130 airplanes were going to go land. I can't remember where. One of our allies in the Middle East, and the helicopters were going to fly back to the USS Nimitz, an aircraft carrier. A helicopter, when they were moving helicopters to refuel, collided with an airplane's tail, crashed, it burned, people died. Some of the helicopters got out of there. Some had to be left behind because of mechanical issues. It was an epic failure. Right. And Jimmy Carter had to go on television the next day and tell the American people that not only had eight Americans died, um, but of course the hostages were not saved. It was, it was kind of the, 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 low, the low point, right, for Jimmy Carter's presidency. The hostage crisis continued, by the way, throughout 1980. You know, every night the news reminded people what day it was. Um, it became a big part of the 1980 presidential election. You know, Ronald Reagan kind of kept pointing out, like, Jimmy Carter can't even rescue American hostages in Iran. How's he going to save you from the Soviets? Finally, uh, the hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, the day Jimmy Carter left office after spending 444 days in captivity. I'll go ahead and really quickly clear this up because everyone's going to say Ronald Reagan did it. No, Ronald Reagan did not do it. The release of the hostages had been agreed upon before Ronald Reagan became president. But the Iranians didn't want the hostages to get freed while Jimmy Carter was president. So I'm not kidding you. They waited until after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office to become president to actually release the hostages. That way, they could say Jimmy Carter didn't actually get them free because he wasn't president when they got their freedom. Anyhow. Um, they eventually got their freedom. Now, uh, we have a couple more sections that we will cover uh, to round out the year. We will look at the birth of the, or the beginnings of the modern conservative movement and how that led to a victory for Ronald Reagan in 1980. And then we'll, we'll cover Ronald Reagan and we'll call it a year.